You could be wiser as an educated advisor. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and money color commentator. On today's show, the longevity impact of products and plans, part three of our series on the mortality revolution, all here on Let's Get Down to Business. Well, welcome to our third segment on the mortality revolution, and now we're going to talk about how this is affecting products and planning. Now, when we talk about types of annuities, we're talking about basic ideas that you use every day in annuities, and I use them again as a defensive posture for longevity. So, what do we do when we have a when we have the mortality revolution, and how does it impact? This impacts issues like QLAX, as an example. These are areas where the the comp the actual government came involved for qualified longevity annuity contracts QLAX, and said that you could push forward to save on RMDs and taxation and Social Security taxation, you could push forward a part and a portion of your actual annuity into the future. And it says that you could take 25% of your qualified plan monies all the way out to age 85. Now you can take it out at 75, 80, 85, whatever you want to do, but you have to take it out by then by 80, age 85. So you could defer up to 25% of your qualified plans to age 85. Now it can't exceed 125,000 for an individual and it can exceed for married couples 250,000. But think about this. If you had RMD problems and you really didn't need the money, you could actually push this forward and trigger this as late as 85. You may want to do that and think about it. The government only allows one type of annuity for this, and it's a deferred income annuity. What did the government see years ago that they said, we have to start instituting this because they already see the longevity movement, the mortality revolution, and how it's impacting everything from pensions, Social Security, Medicare, all these things, long-term care, everything's being impacted by this. So there, this is one of the big reasons why QLACs were invented. And again, shockingly, this did not come necessarily from our industry. This came from the government looking at looking for answers and a couple of wise people that understood this actually brought in this new idea called deferred income annuities. And by the way, a little side note, deferred income annuities have been around for, for a long time. It's not like we invented them four or five years ago. The Prudential, as an example, I think had them in the 1990s. So this is just a, a new a, pro a new way of using the product, we're kind of dusting off an old theory of deferred income annuities and using it now for retirement because we, we're going to need the money. Now, how much does your portfolio have for you? I don't know if you can guarantee your bond income or your stock dividend income off your portfolio. So you can't really say my portfolio will have X amount. We don't know because of the ebbs and flow of the market. So if you're concerned about that and you want to put in a longevity risk product or a risk tool to mitigate the risk of living longer. That's why I like annuities because it works. Don't realize, I don't want you to realize this until it's too late. So you want to be able to look at things like I'm going to be living, if I'm going to retire at 66, there's a chance I could be living for 30 years. If I could be 40, if I'm female and especially in great health. And remember that you're going to have huge odds today. This is today's numbers. Right now, long-term care is being used by about 70% of our seniors. Now, it's not all nursing home. It's some of it's assisted home living. Some of it's just short time. Remember, there's all kinds of applications for long-term care. But the odds are, right now, 70% of seniors are using some degree of long-term care to help them. What's it going to be like when you have to live another 20 years beyond what you thought you were going to live? The odds will then increase, and you'll need long-term care for sure. We're looking at assisted home living, and of course I do. I want to look at assisted home living. I don't want to go to a nursing home. So we're trying to set our lives up to accommodate our geriatric living later on in our life. Now look at these things of estate planning. The exchange from one generation to another generation. Well, that was okay back in the day in the 40s. But now we're seeing one generation, two generations, three generations, and we will become more than likely the first generation, the baby boomers, where we will have great grandchildren during our lifetime and we'll be able to see that as the norm. So we're going to have to start planning in that regard. I mean, think about it. The affluent have a little bit of an edge right now because they have the wherewithal, the monetary wherewithal, to go ahead and take care of all the medical technology and the advantages of having money to keep their health in line. Now, the need really is to plan for an extra 10 years. So whatever your mortality is, I say you need to start planning for another 10 years just to cover it yourself as maybe this technology and advancements take place. We're going to be the beneficiaries of those. And I think you really need to look at that and add another 10 on whatever the number is, add 10. And remember, Medicare for the middle class 
can help a little bit on the medical issues and extending our life, but we don't know where it's going to land right now. We have such a huge unfunded liability on the Medicare area. We just don't know if the government's going to be able to come through with that money. Of course, I'm counting on it. I am Medicare man. So when we're looking at second to die, here's a great thing. Back in the uh, 80s, we changed the, the rule, the Marital Deduction Act, when we said from now on, whenever the first spouse dies, the money transfers to the surviving spouse without any taxable event. It wasn't that way before. So a couple companies, and well, I think one of them, the first one was out of Canada, actually invented this thing called second to die or survivorship life. Two people on one contract, and they didn't pay the claim until the second death. And what had that happened was we had projections on when these death benefits would occur. And in the 20th century, we had an oddity come about from an actuarial point of view. We did not see the kind of female mortality that we had expected. And some people say that I've heard rumors that we have less than 500 death claims all in on all United States carriers. The males died on time, but the females didn't. So until we crept into the 21st century, did we start seeing second eye claims at a level that we expected back in the 20th century. And remember, keep in mind, 87% of survivors of marriages are going to be female. So keep that in your mind when you're making decisions, especially on Social Security. Now, I want to talk about centurions, 100 years or older. I remember when Willard Scott used to say happy birthday to a handful of Americans that were turning 100 and you got on the smucker's jar. I think you remember that. Now, that was just the oddity. But think about it now. We're somewhere around 70,000 uh, 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 centurions. I think there's 70,000 centurions in the United States alone. The United States has the most right now in Japan, number two. But I'm looking at 1 million centenarians by 2050. I mean, think about that. People living to their hundreds. Instead of being an oddity and an outlier on a smucker's jar for Willard Scott, you're going to be one of the regular people in 2050. And that could be, that would be right around when I'm going to turn 100. So I'm looking to see forward if I'm going to make it that far. Also look at, again, workers per beneficiary. Social Security is not a decision you should make by yourself and for your own life. You need to look at your spouse and who's going to outlive the other spouse and look at those numbers. I can't tell you and underscore how important it is to delay your Social Security from age 62 all the way out to age 70. If you can make the move, if you're a boomer right now and you have the choice and you can work a little longer, you can use other funds, I would highly recommend stalling your Social Security at age 70. Shockingly, less than 5% of all seniors today that are taking a constructive receipt of their Social Security are waiting till age 70. I think that's going to be a problem, not maybe for, for most guys, but I think it is for most women. And it's going to affect your spouse. So you don't want to lose out on money. And remember, the average that I've been talking about, these are all averages. That means half of American women, I used the average couple of segments back, 88.8 .8 years. Half of those gals are going to live beyond that time. So we start, we need to look at this and really be hard that when we make a social security decision and we're delaying it, we're delaying it on the benefit most of the time for our female surviving spouse. It's really important. Now I'm looking at some basic collecting social security. You'll notice that when you're looking at assuming full age at 67, the monthly payout is about 2000. And if you take it at 62, you're only getting 75% of your benefit. And it shows the benefit numbers. Look at the difference between age 62 and age 70. 132%, about half the boomers are going to get that number. Some boomers are going to get 130%. It depends upon when you were born. And look at the benefits. The difference between 18,000 and 31,680. If there's any way you can work a little longer, I think that is totally worth it. And then when you look at collecting Social Security late, at age 67, you'll get 108% of your benefit. If you wait till 68, 116. 69, 124. Oh, if you wait till 70, and that's my goal, it'll be 132. So the break-even point, they say, when do we break even? What should I do? When should I do the math? Well, everybody's different. And remember, I have to chart your mortality first before I make that. But we know that if you're age 66 versus you're taking the money at 62, the crossover year is 76. If you take your money at age 70, instead of 66, your crossover year is 81, age 81. And if you wait till you're doing 70 comparing to 62, the crossover year is 79. Most Americans are going to live that long. It's totally worth looking at from a total crossover point of view. 
The rules cannot stay the same. If Social Security moves, Medicare will move with it. Life expectancy is increasing, and there are steps we have to take so that we can survive living longer. Don't forget to watch our next segment on the longevity risks of living longer, part four of our series on the mortality revolution. And keep in mind, before moving forward with any of the ideas on our show, always check with your tax consultant, legal counsel, or compliance officer. And don't forget, you can subscribe to my consumer show, Steve Savant's Money, The Name of the Game. Daily content that you can post on your website, social media accounts, and database distribution. I'm Steve Savant. Thanks for watching.